My name is Terrence Barkin and I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council. We're hosting today's webinar on Atomic, an inter-organizational research platform for atomic with thin coatings that uh, can be used by uh, companies and organizations to help in application development. If you are not familiar with the Graphene Council, we are a global trade and professional body connecting more than 30,000 material scientists in academia and in the commercial sector. We work with companies to advance the commercial adoption of graphene materials, and we're very happy to count Penn State University as one of our member organizations. And I'd like to then introduce Dave Fecco, who is a director at the Material Research Institute at Penn State. And Dave, uh, tell us what we're going to hear about today and uh, introduce our other speakers for us. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Terrence, and thanks to the Graphene Council for hosting us this morning. Uh, my name is Dave Fecco. I do uh, lead the industry outreach efforts for Penn State's Materials Research Institute. Uh, I'm also the industry liaison officer for uh, the Atomic Center, which is what we're here talking about this, mo this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're at. Um, and I'm going to let uh, my colleagues introduce themselves uh, as well. We'll all introduce ourselves before we start our presentation. Mauricio, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Mauricio Tronis. I am uh, the director of, of the Atomic, this uh, Center for Atomically Thin Multifunctional Coatings. Uh, we are uh, free, it's a three university uh, center, so we have three sites. So it's Penn State, Rice University, and Boise State University. I'm professor of physics, uh, also of chemistry and of material sciences at Penn State. Jen? Okay. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jun Lo. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, material science and nano engineering at Rice University. I'm also the site director uh, for the Atomic Center. Uh, as Mauricio just mentioned, we have three sites, uh, Penn State, Rice, and Boise State. So I'm directing the site at Rice University. Great. Thanks, uh, Jun. I'm going to uh, share my screen. We have a presentation uh, queued up to uh, to share with everybody. So I'm going to share it here. Um, Mauricio, Jen, I can see you guys. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and see my slides. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks everybody for being here. And again, thanks to the Graphene Council for hosting us. Uh, we're here today to talk about the Atomic Center, um, which is an industry university cooperative research center that's... Um, hosted at three sites, Penn State University, Rice University, and Boise State. So I want to tell you a little bit about what an IUCRC is. Let me uh, advance the slide here. So um, the IUCRC program is a, it's a very structured program uh, that brings together industry, universities, and government. Um, these, um, it's a framework for these organizations to, to engage uh, together on a technology area. Uh, which um, is for us is atomically thin multifunctional coatings. Um, one of the things that in my role that I really appreciate about IUCRCs is I think they're really excellent engagement points for companies to come in and, um, and work with universities um, in that the fact that you get exposure to a breadth of faculty and uh, center uh, areas inside the university, all inside that technical sandbox that the center operates in. Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to cover a little bit about the structure of uh, the IUCRC program. I'm going to then turn it over to Mauricio, who's going to talk a little bit about our technical focus areas. And then uh, Jonah is going to add some uh, color commentary on what the three sites uh, specifically focus on and a little bit about a few projects in detail. So, um, the IUCRC program has been around for over 30 years. Uh, you can see uh, by the dots on the screen there, the locations of the different sites uh, for about 70-ish active IUCRCs across the country. Each one of those IUCRCs has a different technical focus area. Um, the, uh, one of the requirements of the program is that multiple sites, multiple universities work together uh, to, uh, to, to perform that research. And um, again, the, uh, the idea here is that we, 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 we have a big footprint across the US and we're, we're helping to educate uh, the next uh, group of students that are gonna come into the workforce in an area and 
and provide that talent um, as well as you know generating some uh, good technology advancements in in that technical technical area. So let me talk a little bit about the roles in an IUCRC. So we have um, three different groups of people that I want to talk about. One is the members. That would be probably most of what you all are on the phone would be members of a center. We have the, the government and we have the university team. So the, the members are the, the technical experts uh, or the technical adopters of technology, sorry, the technical adopters of technology and that's in that space. So here, you know, I know we, the Graphene Council focuses on 2D materials and that's really the focus of Atomic is, is uh, applications of multifunctional 2D materials. So I think it's a good audience. Um, you have the marketplace knowledge and experience. Um, the, the members, when they join, uh, put in a membership fee to the center and that membership fee, all those membership fees are pooled together and then they're assigned to uh, various projects uh, based on advisory board voting. So if you're a member, you have a seat on the advisory board and you help to direct the center uh, what projects are funded and in which projects are, um, you know, the direction, what projects are requested for, uh, for proposals and whatnot for the, for the next round. Uh, we have two biannual meetings, one in May and one in November, uh, that as a member you would uh, want, to, want to attend. We're also asking our members to act as a mentor on at least one of these projects. Uh, the mentorships typically is done remotely uh, via Zoom meetings. Uh, typically, you're, you're talking with one of the project teams on, on a somewhat regular basis, maybe monthly basis. Um, and again, um, you are providing um, guidance for that project and also guidance for the center. Uh, each year, we, you know, every, every once in a while, we put out a call for proposals in new topic areas. And when the proposals come in, the different center members uh, can provide input to the different research projects uh, so that and adjust the projects based on what the members really want to see out of the research projects. Uh, and that all happens before the voting. So a lot of times companies, you know, will hear the question, well, you know, do I have a project that I, that I will be, you know, responsible for? And the answer is not really, because again, this is a pooled set of resources. So you don't have one project, you have the whole suite of projects that are, you know, really your projects and, and you can help to, uh, to guide those projects and adjust them uh, to, to meet your company's needs all through the, the lifetime of the projects. We typically run about two year projects. Um, the government members, typically that's gonna be the NSF, the National Science Foundation. They, they provide the oper operational framework for the center. So the things like the membership agreement, um, they provide some, um, some templates for, for uh, the bylaws of the center. And uh, we run the, the center based on sort of what NSF requires us to, and that's things like the, the two meetings a year. Uh, there is uh, somebody that attends the meetings from NSF that provides oversight uh, for, the, for the center and making sure that we're in fact meeting um, not only the NSF's requirements, but also you know, making the members happy. Uh, we also have some administrative funding that comes to the center from, from NSF, and that's really, that's really just enough to support uh, typically somebody that's there to help us run conferences, the biannual conferences, and manage the website and whatnot. And then the university teams, this is where the, uh, the research gets done. Um, the university teams typically, you know, we've got a number of faculty at each of the sites that are technical experts in their areas. Uh, we have uh, the facilities in the in the set, in the uh, sites at the different universities are all, you know, very set up well for uh, research on 2D materials. Um, we have the students, uh, and but the the universities also contribute to the uh, financial aspect of the center and we do that through support of the overhead in the center so when a project when, when we when we get it when when the center was formed um, the universities all agreed uh, to NSF that we would do the research at a 10 percent overhead uh, if you get involved in at all in budgeting with your company you know that 10 percent overhead is you know ridiculously low uh, for anybody uh, typically, our, our normal industry-sponsored research overhead at, at Penn State, at least, is around 65%. So it's a significant 
um, you know, reduction in that overhead cost. And we really do that to support the research that goes on this in the center to make the membership dollars stretch far, farther. So you can see everybody has a, um, a financial piece to the, to the center. Um, some of the intangibles for membership that um, are probably obvious, but I'll point them out anyway. One is uh, we work with a lot of students. So if you hire, you know, students coming out of colleges, uh, you'll want to keep your eye on the students, eyes on the students that are working in the center. You'll get to know them well, uh, and hopefully you'll you'll find some some rock stars in our students, which um, you can bring on board to your company, and and they'll they'll be already trained in uh, doing industry relevant research. Um, that's one one sort of intangible. Another is that um, we do a lot of relevant research at each of the universities in areas that we think you are probably interested in. Uh, one example, at Penn State, we have a, an NSF user facility called the Two-Dimensional Crystal Consortium. This is about a $15 million effort um, that, you know, to, to do research on two-dimensional materials. And the research that goes on in that facility, as well as the facilities themselves, you get to see the facility when you're here, you'll tour the facility, maybe meet some of the uh, scientists that work in that facility, but you'll be exposed to what goes on there. And hopefully that'll give you some background knowledge for where, you know, where that uh, technology is headed in the future. Um, another thing, um, you know, that uh, intangible is access to the uh, research facilities at the three institutions. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about that again in the future, but, but you know, especially with in the actual atomic projects, all these facilities are open for use uh, to, to help uh, solve the, the challenges and the, the research that goes on in the, uh, in the uh, projects. And, and also sort of another one is uh, networking with your peers and supply chain partners in the, uh, in the center. And finally, just let me wrap up and then I'll pass it off to Mauricio with a comment on the research in IUCRC. So again, I wanna point out the industry members select the projects and really drive the technical direction of the center. Uh, each of the projects are run by student faculty teams and uh, pre-competitive technology areas is really big for the center because we really want to stay away from um, tech, you know, from things that really only apply to one member. This is a consortium. So we're looking at the big, uh, big picture between uh, a technical area that's going to affect everybody in that, in that um, field. And while IP is not a primary goal of the center, uh, it can be generated. And if it's generated, it will be shared among uh, the members. Uh, so ultimately, what we're what we're talking about is a um, reduced overhead and pooled resources that your organization's a a significant uh, financial um, uh, incentive to, uh, to 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 membership over a direct you know research project with uh, one of the one of the faculty members in the center. So anyway, I'm going to let um, turn things over to Mauricio and let him talk a little bit about the technical areas that the center focuses on. So okay, I'll yeah. start here. Thanks a lot, Dave. So yeah, my name is Mauricio Torones again. So for for those who ju just joined, and uh, I'm I'm the director of the center. So this is a three site center. So it's Penn State, Rice University, and Boise State University. And let me just talk a little bit about uh, you know graphing. Of course, I mean if you are part of the graphing council, you know what graphing is, right? So, uh, but one thing that I would like to emphasize here is that graphing is uh, uh, it's a sheet of, of sp2 hybridized carbon so it's, it's like hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms and one thing that is very important to note here is that the carbon carbon bond is one of the strongest bonds in nature so if you have a graphing sheet it would be extremely strong and again it would be one atom thick so it would be transparent and for example uh, you have a graphing sheet of one square meter you would be able to to uh, to carry a cat without breaking it, right? Uh, of course, if it's if it has no no defects. But one thing that is important is that graphene is the mother of all these other forms of carbon, like carbon nanotubes, and like uh, buckyballs or carbon sixty, right? So uh, when you start stacking graphene sheets one on top of the other, you get graphite, like it's that's the one that you have in your pencil legs. But if you have just one single graphene sheet and you roll it you would form a carbon nanotube, uh, which has very different properties compared to graphene. And depending on the chirality, the carbon nanotube might be semiconductor or metallic. 
And also you start introducing, for example, uh, pentagons to the to the graphing sheet, you will start to provide some positive curvature and then you will be able to get sphere. Uh, and that's a full ring. So uh, graphing is it's it's one, but it, it, it's, it was the first to the material that was uh, you know, isolated and it was measured, uh, but uh, but graphene is just one of many layer materials. And here you have uh, other other layer materials, which are, for example, hexagonal boronitride, which is an insulator, right? And uh, you can have semiconductors like molydisulfide or tungsten disulfide. Or you can also have metallic system that I that even that are even superconducting, right? Like niobium selenide or niobium sulfide. One thing that is important as well, and I will talk later, it's 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 the phase. But I mean, the whole thing here is that there are more than a thousand layer materials, and if you take just one single sheet of this, uh, the properties of that single sheet will be different compared to the bulk. And uh, and you're gonna start start stacking different layers one on top of the other, and then you we call these Van der Waals solids, uh, and this is what in, in principle can bring you the multifunctionality because you have a metal you have a metal you have an insulator, you have a semiconductor you stack them in the way you want you might be able to create a multifunctional coatings and that's what the center atomic is it's, it's basically dedicated to. Uh, Let's let's go to the transition metal dichargogenide, so which TMD, which is uh, uh, that's the acronym, transition metal dichargogenides, and uh, so the calcogen atoms are sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. That are they're on the right side of the uh, of the periodic table. But you can also have transition metals like moly and tungsten, and then you can also have uh, vanadium, niobium, tantalum, or titanium, zirconium, and hafnium. And then what is important here, the way in this case, it's, it's not a single monolayer, it's like tri-layer, but that would be a monolayer of uh, transition metal like a cogenite. And, and depending how the, the atoms are stacked, so uh, the top and bottom atoms are usually this calcogen atom. So it's like a sandwich and you have the cheese in between and the cheese would be the metal and the, and the bread would be the calcogen atoms. And uh, depending how these are stacked, you could get semiconducting systems or metallic systems. And uh, which can be, again, uh, here on the right-hand side, we have different different systems with vanadium, niobium, and tantalum. And then you can have paramagnetic, antiferromagnetic, diamagnetic materials. Uh, you can also have uh, moly and tungsten uh, selenides or sulfides, which are semiconductors. But the tellurides, if, if depending on the on the phase, it can be metallic and, and even superconducting as well. Uh, and and then you can go on and on and on with with other other sulfides and selenides of these materials. So uh, the the good thing about this is that we can now using we can use graphene, but we can also use other layered systems, and we can start stacking. But the idea is to have uh, you know codings for different applications. In this case, we have extreme environments. And uh, uh, the next slide. So we can try to, this is something that George Robinson was uh, was able to uh, to find. When when you have a calcogenite, uh, in this case, it was uh, uh, tungsten diselenide. So what, what, what happens is that when you heat it in hydrogen and argon, and then you heat it up to 600 degrees centigrade, uh, the material is still it's it's stable, right? Uh, at 700, you start to get you know a clustering or, or or the or degradation of the material. At 800, you can see these cracks and the material is is peeling away. And at 950, the material is it's it's peeling away. But again, uh, these materials have all of them have different properties. And for example, hexagonal boronitride is something that. Uh, we can basically uh, isolate, and this is this is very very good for extreme environments. The next slide. So atomic started the phase one was the, we had only two sides, so it was Penn State and Rice. And here, the main topics that we were concentrating based on the input we just got from the industry industry advisory board, it was energy conversion and storage. That was one of the topics. Pro protective coatings. Uh, anti-corrosion coatings, 
uh, or queries with where properties. And then the other, uh, you know, thrust was electronic, electronics and sensing. So these three thrusts were, we basically concentrated in, in phase one. And then we just moved to phase two, which is the next slide. And then we can see here phase one, which was just Penn State and Rice. And then we moved to, to phase two, which is Penn State, Rice, and Boise State. And then here we have the new, new drivers. So we have electronic and sensing, protective coatings, energy conversion, and storage. But we want to go beyond that, right? So we want to move into Internet of Things. We want to move into healthcare. And we want to move into smart autonomous systems. And our research goals for phase two, and this is the, the phase two of the, the next five years, together with Boise State and Rice University would be uh, how to make these two materials, uh, I mean, the production scalable. Can we scale the production process in a, in a cheap way? We need to also benchmark the properties of these materials and compare with other materials that are in the market. Uh, we need also to design prototypes. The phase two of atomic now, it's a bit more applied. So the tier levels is a bit higher than what we used to have in phase one. And uh, it's very good that we have Boise State because um, Boise State is it's also towards more applied and Jun Lu will talk about that uh, in particular. The next slide. Uh, here's just to show you the impact of the free sites. So, so since 2012, uh, we have published, and this is up until November last year, we have published around 3,000 papers now, if we count the 2021. And uh, 3,000 papers for three sites is a lot of papers. And here you can see on the left-hand side, you can see the journals, the number of publications in different journals and the impact factor. So ACS Nano is our, uh, we are our winner. Uh, but we publish in, in the best journals with very high impact factors as well. Uh, you can see, so having 3,000 uh, uh, papers and we also have patents, that means that we are uh, a very strong and solid uh, center with free sites. Next slide. So uh, here we, we can see some of the PIs in the labs uh, working on, on different uh, you know, experiments, synthesis of 2D materials. And, uh, and I just wanted to show you the next slide. It's the expertise that the three sites have. Uh, so here we have Penn State, we have Boise State and Rice. And we, you can see that we are experts in different areas. But also we 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 have intersections uh, among the three sites also and uh, you know between two sites. Uh, I I will not go just go through the the all the text here. But but for example, we are very good in MOCVD. We are very good in electro the chemical deposition. That's Penn State. Uh, Boise State is very good in ink synth synthesis in manufacturing additive electronics. Uh, and extreme environment coatings. And RICE is very good in, in energy harvesting, ball milling, spray coating technologies, and photocatalytic surfaces. And then we have the intersections of things that, that we can basically see that in electronics, sensors, uh, uh, atomic layer deposition, modeling, antennas, and, and devices, we are basically uh, intersecting. Uh, so I just, with that, I finish and I leave the, not the mic to, to June. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mauricio. And <clears throat> again, my name is uh, June Lo from Rice University. I'm the site director for Atomic, uh, for those of you who just joined. Um, so uh, following Mauricio and uh, Dave's introduction, I just want to uh, re-emphasize again here that uh, once you join Atomic, you're not working with one specific PI's team. You actually have the opportunity to work with a larger group of uh, uh, PI's with very complementary expertise. I think that's one of the biggest benefit of being a consortium like this type. And you can see the PI's from the three sides on this slide. I'm not going to go through the details, uh, introduction of them, and uh, uh, once you get the slide, I, I believe you can actually click on the image yep. and go to their uh, respective uh, introductory website to learn more about what they do uh, in their research. Um, next slide, please. So um, speaking about the current operation of phase two 
uh, topic. Uh, right now we have um, several ongoing projects, um, actually um, eight in total, uh, three at Penn State, two at Rice, and three at Voices State University. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, Mauricio already explained to you, um, the in the phase two, uh, we are still uh, anchored in the three uh, important areas for atomic, including the uh, electronic sensing uh, applications, protective coating, um, as well as scalable process. But we also are branching out. Uh, one thing you can see from the, the title of those uh, um, uh, projects, uh, a lot of uh, projects now focus on the benchmarking. I think this is really important for the industry application. We need to compare uh, what we achieve in the lab to what is the current standard in the industry and uh, basically show the promise of the material or the coatings for developing uh, in atomic. And the, <clears throat> another concentration is in the area of uh, sensing, right? Uh, not only just on the electronic sensing, but also on the biomedical sensing. Uh, as also Mauricio mentioned, we are interested in branching out to the healthcare uh, uh, industry. Uh, and finally, uh, there are a few projects focusing on the scalable process, right? Uh, in the end, uh, you want to go out of the lab and across the valley of death in order to make those laboratory material into the real industry application. So we have been uh, working very actively in those three directions. So next, let me give you a few snapshots about the projects uh, ongoing. Uh, the first one is a project happened to be the uh, project I'm directing. Uh, that's basically uh, trying to researching on the very interesting material, uh, hexagonal boron nitride. Uh, uh, Mauricio gave you a very good introduction about graphene. And for those of you who are familiar with hexagonal boron nitride, uh, sometimes it's been called the white graphene, right? Because the color uh, is white uh, compared to the graphite is uh, black. And the hexagonal lattice structure is very similar to graphene. You're just replacing the carbon atoms with the boron and nitrogen. And the lattice mismatch between the two material is actually less than 3%, 2.3%, something like that. So it's very similar. It shares many uh, exciting properties graphene has. For example, very high strengths, right? Um, it doesn't have the carbon-carbon bond, but the strengths and the modulars are actually not too far away from graphene. And the one thing interesting about the hexagonal boron nitride is also because of that uh, uh, polo uh, structure, right? You have this uh, uh, molecular dipole or the atom dipoles within the individual hexagon ring. Uh, that actually gave you some very interesting uh, properties. For example, last year we published a nature paper demonstrated that HBN actually has the highest fracture toughness. Uh, fracture toughness is defined as material resistant for the crack advancement in materials. Uh, it's a fundamental material property. So the fracture toughness of HBN is actually uh, much higher compared to the graphene. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it also has very, very good thermal stability and also uh, chemical stability. Uh, Mauricio uh, mentioned about uh, application of HBN in the harsh environment or extreme conditions. Uh, that's why it's being widely considered as a protective coating. Okay, so in this project, uh, we're trying to uh, not only build on our past research, um, uh, almost a decade of uh, research experience in this material uh, to uh, apply that for protective coating, anti-corrosion, anti-oxidation uh, uh, coating. We're also trying to uh, make the scalable synthesis process viable, right? Uh, we're trying to do both the chemical vapor deposition as well as uh, liquid processing uh, in this case, is uh, uh, AI-assisted uh, bone milling process. Uh, we're using AI to help us uh, to uh, uh, find the right surfactant or the, the chemicals uh, to separate those layers more efficiently. Okay, so uh, I think I have spent enough time here uh, on this one project. I just want to give you some ideas. Uh, all of our PIs are extremely passionate about our research. Uh, I can go on for an hour to tell you about uh, all we do here. Okay, uh, please move to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, this one is the one that I mentioned about the benchmarking effort uh, we're doing. Uh, this uh, is the uh, project from Penn State. Uh, Ada uh, Ibrahim is the uh, PI here. 
So her group uh, working with uh, uh, Josh, Moore, uh, Josh uh, Robinson's group uh, is trying to essentially uh, utilizing the electrochemical properties of 2D material for biomedical sensing uh, applications. Okay. So because of the defect, uh, unavoidable defect in a lot of those TMD material, uh, transition metal dichocogenides, uh, they also have very interesting, uh, also very specific uh, uh, reactions towards certain uh, electrochemical uh, processes. So it can be utilized for the sensing purpose. Uh, in this uh, project, um, uh, uh, Ada's team is trying to benchmark uh, different materials uh, for the uh, synthesis, uh, for the sensing of uh, the biomolecules. Okay, uh, please uh, next slide. Uh, this is also the effort from our uh, new site, uh, uh, Boise State uh, University. Uh, Harish is the PI in this project, and uh, the main purpose of this project is uh, uh, to really optimize the processing param parameters, uh, the ink properties, uh, because they are really specialized uh, in 3D uh, printing of electronics and uh, the ink preparation is really important for those process. So the ink property processing parameters and, and the uh, final printed device performance, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, parameters to be optimized. In order to do that, they are trying to use a machine learning algorithm to help them to uh, optimize this process. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is one of the interesting projects uh, from my uh, uh, colleague and uh, co-director at Rice site, uh, Professor Puliko Ajayan. And uh, his group in the past has been developing very interesting multi-layer uh, energy storage devices, uh, essentially to provide the, the power for the electronic sensor you saw uh, earlier. And uh, in this particular project, they're going one step further uh, they're trying to use metallic phase of 2D material to build the nano antennas. So you can actually transmit the signal you detect from the sensing unit uh, to uh, uh, a nearby control unit. Okay, so this is uh, uh, a very recent effort from a giant lab. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, with that, a quick introduction about the, the ongoing project. Uh, I just want to share with you we have had very strong support from industry, uh, defense lab, uh, and also um, uh, some of them are considering joining uh, uh, as a promising uh, members. So let me just quickly uh, go through those uh, uh, current members. Uh, we have uh, some members have been with us uh, since phase one for a very long time, including Morgan Advanced Material, Honda Research, um, the uh, RDAC, uh, Murata, and the Air Force Research Lab. So those are the long-standing members of us. And uh, as we are entering into phase two, we are also very fortunate to have support from Fujifilm, uh, Idaho National Lab, uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, Dactronics, uh, and we have another Air Force Research Lab site, uh, as well as uh, two very big uh, semiconductor related company, Applied Materials and the EMD Performance Materials. And uh, there are a few uh, additional members right now uh, in the discussion to join us. Um, and you can see their name there, including Micron and not, not, uh, NASA uh, Goddard uh, Center and also Exotron. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so Mauricio mentioned that we also, Dave mentioned, we have uh, uh, two uh, semi-annual meetings uh, to have everybody uh, the, sh the stakeholder coming together to discuss atomic projects. Uh, the next one for our industry advisory board meeting will be November 17th and 18th. It will be in Boise uh, State University. So it's Boise, Idaho, uh, a very beautiful city I heard. And uh, I hope some of you will consider uh, joining us as a visitor. Okay, uh, next um, slide. One of the other things I want to just mention too, um, Jen, uh, we're going to be in Pittsburgh at the uh, uh, Graphene Council uh, meeting on on Monday, October tenth, and uh, we'll also be around during the uh, uh, the conference at the uh, convention center the the day after that materials conference. Uh, I think that's pretty much wraps up the slides. Um, let me see. Do I have one more? 
there's there's also a slide that has a little bit more background on the uh, IUCRC program and a short little video describing the uh, IUCRC program. And uh, I think we're going to make these slides available to everybody, right, Terrence? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you can go through those if you have if anybody has questions on on those uh, slides, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I just want to make some observations from my side because <clears throat> we work with a lot of companies that are involved in application development, research and development. And um, having been at the facilities, by the way, at Penn State, the 2D research lab that you have, you know, the, the, the uh, facilities that you have and the personnel that you have is really an incredible resource um, to, to be made available for companies that want to engage in this. Um, I think that the collaborative effort and the fact that any IP that's developed under this program is shared with all of the project participants is a really unique feature for um, many of these kind of research uh, collaborations. The IP is not treated quite that way. I don't know if you have any um, additional comments to that, but that's one important observation yeah. I want to make. Yeah, I, I, I think we can add a little color commentary to that, Terrence. I'll, I'll start and ask my colleagues to join in. But, you know, we do see this program as something that um, we hope that companies are very interested in. And it's, you know, I, I, I tried to drill down a little bit more on the reasons why it's so cost effective. But, um, you know, if you try to do, if you wanted to do a standalone uh, faculty uh, industry sponsored research project, it, it's probably going to be about, let's say, twice as expensive as a membership uh, to, to Atomic. And while you do have, you know, maybe some more, um, you know, you can get uh, some exclusivity on research that comes out of a direct fac faculty sponsored research project. You know, the way we see the center uh, operating, the, the technology that comes out of the center, first of all, you've got eight different projects going on. And as we add, add more members, you'll, you'll have more uh, projects than that. Uh, so each of those has the possibility of generating some really nice IP. We've had some uh, pretty recent uh, discoveries that I think are, are somewhat exciting um, that we really, you know, that's kind of members only type information. So we can't really share a lot about that stuff. Um, but, um, you know, once you see an area that you want to you use that as background IP and then develop your own technology, you know, based on that background IP, develop foreground IP off of that, that's all fair game. And our, our, um, Faculty members at the different university sites are also happy, willing, and willing to help uh, with, you know, sponsored research that goes outside of the center where you might have more ownership, individual ownership of that technology. But yeah, the driving force here really is industry relevant research, and so um, so that's that's the direction that we're trying to push. Um, Mauricio, Jin, any comments? No, I I, I think this is uh, again. I mean. Uh, this is unique because it's a consortium, and again, uh, we the industry advisory board guides also the the topics that they are interested. So depending on the interest of the companies, so that's why we we have these different frosts, and these different frosts are evolving in time, and and the IP is it's quite an important, uh, yeah, very important for 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 companies, right? Because sometimes some companies might like to take this as background IP and then they can develop uh, an in a research project independent from Atomic in their own interest, right? Uh, in their own, in the topics they are interested. So I, I think there are different ways that, that to collaborate. Of course, Atomic is, is it, it's where everything starts, but the idea is to move forward and to really get to the materials uh, with an added value for coatings. Absolutely. Uh, another observation, then June, I have a question for you and for Maurizio. Um, <clears throat> the observation is on the on the amount of the contribution that goes to overheads at ten percent. That's um, don't change it, but it's ridiculously low, right? So that's that's quite economical for most projects where you're contributing like this. Much more than ten percent would not go directly into the project itself. Um, and and just restating the obvious, what was just said, I, I just want to make sure we capture the. The, the impact of that, when a company joins, they're able to put in, um, you know, what their desire is for where the area of study will be, but they have access to all the projects, right? So not just the one that they're interested in. And so often 
um, application development is a serendipitous process where you see something going on in another area and you can see how it can apply to your area. This is, I think, the beauty of this. You get the oversight of all these projects um, as a participant. And, and here's my question for you, June, and for Maurizio in particular. Obviously, as the graphene council, we're very focused on graphene as a material. Um, but, you know, it's, it's quite obvious that there are many 2D materials out there and there are going to be more tomorrow. My experience has been in looking at things like Maxines and TMDs and, and, and these other, and HBN. We have graphene companies that make graphene and they make HBN, for example. I'd like you guys to talk a little bit about the future of uh, graphene in particular, but how graphene can be used with these other 2D materials as complementary or in sandwiches or heterostructures or these hybrid structures. How do you see the 2D materials coming together? You know, it's not graphene or something else, it's graphene and something else. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe I can take a first step at this one, and then Mauricio, you can, uh, you know, uh, comment after I my answer. I think absolutely, uh, Terence, uh, graphene is uh, really the the starting point of all the two D material research, right? Uh, and right now we have uh, branched out to so many other different uh, um, systems, but. Uh, one of the beauty about those atomically thin material is, uh, especially for the coating, as we are very broadly defined in the center, is that you have such thin thickness, there are a lot of room for you to build up those multifunctional system. So you can actually have what I mentioned in the uh, discussion, have like a, a, a energy storage unit, as well as a sensing unit, all on the same coating system. And it still is like less than a couple hundred nanometer in thickness. Right. So that that is something uh, not possible with other materials. Uh, in that system, in those devices, you have to use different components for different purposes, right? Graphene is a really good conductor. So it can be used as a very good interconnect, for example, in, in some cases. And you can use TMD as a really good semiconducting unit. And HBN is really good dielectrics. So if you combine those together, you can get a very high performance devices. And uh, I don't think they are mutually exclusive. In fact, they are very highly complementary. Thank you. And Mauricio? Yeah, and the fact that they are to the materials atomically thin is that you can top, put one on top of the other and you still have a few layers. It will be transparent, right? So you have some transparency. Again, depends on the application, but I, th I think it's, it's, it's uh, the imagination is endless, right? So this is some some of the things that we're working on uh, with, I mean, that companies are very interested. And one thing that I wanted to mention was also in in some cases, companies have like three or four, uh, you know, researchers working on different different areas and, and, and they're working on different projects, but they are also mentoring also different, different projects within Atomic. So that's an incredible, added value to, to the company because they have access and, and they have interactions and they have lots of information that it's, it, that information can be used. I mean, of course, because it's, it, it's, it's for members, right? Can be used by the company and they can see if, of, of course, benchmarking, they, they can see if this is good, this is not bad, if this material is better than the other one, but also they can go in different directions, but you have all this information that if you try to do it yourself as a company, it would be very, very expensive. So if I if I could paraphrase your comment, this yeah. is a way for companies to really leverage their R and D capacity, right? They can take their expertise and yeah. what they're doing internally, and they can multiply it through the atomic system. Is that is that a fair restatement? Yeah, that that's 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 correct. Yes. Um, yeah, Terence, so, if uh, you allow me, uh, let me circle back to your comment on the 10% uh, overhead. I think uh, uh, Dave actually uh, mentioned that during his uh, discussion, but maybe not uh, very exclusively highlighting that. I, I want to say that uh, if you become a member, uh, not only you're paying much lower overhead, 10% is an incredible deal, but also you can access the, all the uh, instruments uh, at three university sites at the, the uh, internal rate. Uh, as some of you know that internal rate versus the external rate when you have for-profit company organization coming to university, 
the difference is five times, uh, sometimes even higher. So uh, some company will say that even just by using the, the facility uh, through Atomic uh, is worth the, the membership. Uh, that's well, the one point I want to mention. Yeah. No, th thank you for raising that. That's, that's actually really, really important because the, the capital investment that the universities have made into the equipment um, is, you know, multi, multi, multi-million dollar investments, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of investment into some of these departments. Um, we have a question from the audience about applications. Now, again, I, I think you've all touched on this a bit. The fact that we're talking about coatings kind of hides the diversity of applications where coatings could be applied, right? You mentioned briefly interconnects could be one, protective coatings would be another one. Um, the question we have is about automotive applications, which Obviously, there's, you know, dozens of ways of getting into the transportation uh, vehicles with these kind of applications, but specifically about composites uh, and applications research. Can you talk a little bit about if Atomic touches on composites and how? Yes, uh, it's actually a very important research area for 2D material, right? Adding those uh, 2D elements into different matrices to make composite. Uh, that's a major research area. And in the atomic center, that's also uh, part of our research. Uh, sometimes the coating we make uh, is not made of pure 2D material. Uh, you have to have uh, some sort of uh, matrix or binders uh, to keep them together, especially those uh, 2D flakes or 2D nanosheets made through the liquid processing uh, method. But it can also be more than just the coating. You can also try to make a uh, more structural composite. Uh, using those uh, 2D materials. Uh, some of the materials has very interesting property like uh, self-stiffening. Uh, you can actually have polymer chains uh, align themselves along those 2D sheets and they become stronger as you cycle them uh, in the loading condition. So uh, for the automobile industry, I think uh, certainly that's of interest to us. And you can see one of our members, Honda Research. Honda is a car maker. Right, uh, they are interested in uh, many different aspects of two D material application. Um, I think uh, that sort of answer. I hope answer your question. Thank you. So, uh, one thing, Terrence, I'd say on that too. Um, you know, the the center right now, our portfolio of research is a result of the portfolio of companies that we have as members. And so, as we grow and add members in different areas, it's possible that things can shift. So. Well, Honda Research, you know, Honda is an automotive company, but the Honda Research Institute does a lot of research in a lot of other areas. If we had a few, you know, big uh, automotive manufacturers like, you know, Ford, uh, um, you know, uh, BMW, yeah, somebody like that, you know, we, we, we could potentially try to look at research in that space where we're putting uh, 2D materials into, you know, into resins for improved properties or performance characteristics that they could bring to, uh, to composites. So anyway, that's, no, that's, that's, uh, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, and Dave, maybe we'll stick with you and to answer the next question. So um, the comment from the audience was that this IP approach of collaborative mm -hmm. IP or shared IP is quite interesting. Um, the question was, uh, ha have any of the, um, has any of the IP that's been developed, are there patents being pursued for any of it? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that we talk about in our biannual meetings is what research has come out of the research projects in the past uh, six months that we want to look at potentially protecting. Um, and we we try to reach an agreement on which areas, you know, which which intellectual property nuggets that we want to go after. Um, and then we can, um, you know, we can protect that IP. The way that that's handled is, um, you know, the we poll the members when we have a, you know, a technology and I and I uh, um, invention, and we say, hey, are you interested in this? And those members that are interested in the IP will part will uh, support the, um, you know, uh, protection of that IP. So all the work that goes around uh, filing a provisional patent or a full patent, and could even be patents in other countries as well. Um, but that's something, you know, that's the costs of the patenting process are not, you know, captured in the research costs of the center. And so we expect our members that would be using that IP to help support those costs. So you have to kind of raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm interested. And then, and then that will get you in the queue to participate in those patents. But yes, we are. In fact, um, we have, 
I think it's probably last, up to about last, what last year. Last year we have filed three, right? Yeah, I was going to say. I think all told, we're probably yeah. up to you know uh, closing in on a handful of of technologies that we've uh, pursued licensing of uh, uh, patents on, and um, you know I think we're I think we're pushing close on some of these to getting some really novel and interesting ideas. Um, I can't say a whole lot about some of these things, but I've heard of some things recently that are really uh, you know they're pretty exciting uh, opportunities. So. Um, it's a okay. good opportunity for, for companies. The the approach you just described, though, um, I, I think that's quite fair and equitable, right? So if some if some IP is developed during the course of the research, that has value to the participants. If it rises to the point where it's patentable, then those companies that have a stake in it would then underwrite the patenting process, which means those that are not interested are, are their their contribution is not going towards that, right? They're not paying for something they're not using. And those companies right. that do want a patent, then they can participate and benefit from the fruits of the patent. So exactly. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's a fair, that's a very fair and equitable way to go at it. Um, I think we have, uh, well, the question I think actually, um, let's see, if we, let's read this question. And it's about patenting again. Um, I would like to understand how patents and licensing are managed. Patents are owned by someone. So understanding how the members get access. I think it yeah. just sounds like, you know, that the participants in the in the underwriting, they share in the patent ownership. Yeah. So actually, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent question and probably something I didn't do a good job of pointing out. So we have the three sites, Penn State, Rice and Boise State. And depending on where the invention has occurred. That's the licensing or the patenting office that would handle the filing of the patents at the university. But all three sites agree that once the patent is in fact filed, you know, or once once we know who is participating, that that licensing office at that university would issue a uh, royalty free, non exclusive license to those members that have participated in the you know securing in the costs associated with filing that patent. Understood. Excellent. Well, I think from my side, um, you know, just to kind of sum this up, you guys have a fantastic set of resources across the three institutions for this research and application development for 2D materials, specifically coatings, but that, that hides the diversity of applications that coatings apply to. It's really what 2D dimensional materials are really well suited for. Um, I think that um, even the amount of investment, a $45,000 investment, is not exceptionally high. I think that you know what you get for your investment um, is really good value for money, um, and it's well applied. So I think this is a unique opportunity for companies to take advantage of this. The perspective from the Graphene Council, of course, you know, like I said, Penn State is a member of the Graphene Council, for which we're very happy and uh, proud to have you as members. Um, if anybody is working on graphene or other two-dimensional materials, we, al we also work with, uh, with Maxine's and, and as more 2D materials expand, we're going to be working with more. But um, that's part of what the Graphene Council does is help to connect resources between those that can produce these materials and those that need to use them uh, so they, they can be applied. And actually, I'm going to contradict myself. One of the things that's really important about working with expertise like this is it one should not underestimate the difficulty in manufacturing and manipulating these 2D materials, right? So it's not like, you know, I can buy a kilo of graphene and, and, and chuck it into a product and then away you go. It's, it's really quite, um, quite important to tailor the use to the application and to, to, um, to be able to manipulate these materials effectively. And that's some specialty expertise that's not commonly available. And I, I just wanted, I don't know if you guys have any comment on that one, but I think that's another reason to work with these experts as opposed to companies struggling um, when they may not have um, all of the insight that they need to work with two-dimensional materials. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll let Mauricio and Jin comment, but I think, you know, that's one of the big beauties of of joining a center like this is with the membership fee, you you know, you have access to all this technology and, and you see what's going on in this space. Uh, you see where the direction that the technology is headed and how to apply it. And that's that's sort of part of the benefit of, of membership is just um, getting your feet wet in an area that you you may not may not know well. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah, students as well. I mean, you have access to students. When they graduate, they, they can go and work for, for different companies, right? So and they, they can be monitored for a few years, and then after, when they are ready, yeah, the companies. Yeah, it's important to have those know-how knowledge. And uh, one uh, feature of uh, uh, those uh, atomic center is essentially uh, the company uh, engineers or the people interested in the technology can come to the university side, work alongside with the students. So you get the first-hand information on the know-how, right? You can also offer internship to students to work in your side if there are some uh, uh, a material you don't want to be shared among other people, then that is another way to work. So it's very flexible and you'll get a lot of know-hows uh, in this process. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the Graphene Council, we're extremely pleased to support and encourage companies to consider joining Atomic. We think this is a great resource and a really good way to go for application development and research. And uh, for those of you who are not members of the Graphene Council and would like to get access to the information we provide, of course, we encourage you to consider that as well. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Terrence. We'll see you in Pittsburgh.